Dear Heavenly Father, Father, the warmth of your body gathered is, is a joy, and it is such a clear reminder, Father, that we have been made one in you by the power of your Son and his death and the Holy Spirit sent to us. And Father, that miracle as we live it out every day is uh, never more real than as we gather to study your word. Called together by like purpose and uh, a heart, Father, united in love for you and because of you. And, and here's the word, Father, set before us so that we can be like you. Father, that purpose in our Christian walk is the central purpose, Father, the central calling for each of us to be like you according to your word. So I give you praise and thanks that you have put that burden on the hearts of so many here tonight, that they would devote time in the middle of a busy week to come together and to listen to your word. Father, that, uh, that is a blessing not only for each of us who may listen and learn, but uh, for those who have put effort into preparing, Father, that you would receive that preparation and make the most of it. Father, for the word before us, we have uh, time spent in preparation on my part and uh, on the parts of those who have come ready to listen. But, Father, the real work is that of your Holy Spirit in our hearts. I pray that we would not put any obstacles to that work, that our minds and hearts would be open to what you've prepared to, to deliver tonight. Let us uh, not only hear it, Father, and not only bury it in our hearts, Father, but have the courage to, to live it out as you may convict and may guide. Father, I praise you for the time tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, as I hope you do, open up with me to Jonah, chapter 3. We uh, rejoin Jonah as he is coming up out of the fish at the end of chapter 2. Remembering back last week, we had studied Jonah in the belly of the fish, praying from that position, praying for not release from the fish, if you remember, but rather assuming that he had died and praying as if he were in Sheol, believing that's where he's at. Because as we taught last week, though you and I know different, and certainly he knew different after he left the fish, in the midst of the moment, the text seems to make clear, at least to me and I hope to you as well, that what he anticipated was not what happened. What he felt was not what he expected. And his interpretation of the moment was, I'm being punished by God in Sheol for my disobedience. And as he prays to God under those circumstances, rather than praying for release from a fish, which he never understood at the mo in the moment, he rather prays two things. He prays in praise to God, praising God, and recommits to faithfulness to his calling. And as a second chance, God deposits him on the shores of Israel. You know, if he had actually died and found himself in Sheol, that prayer never would have worked. For those who have died, there is no second chance, as the Scriptures tell us. Not in the sense of how Jonah received his. That's why I said when I talked last week that this scene reminded me so much of Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol when Ebenezer Scrooge awakens from that final visitation only to realize he hadn't died after all. He still had that second chance. And of course, after that final vision, he's a new man. He excitedly sets about making amends for that callous and, and careless and unloving life that he had lived up to that point. I wonder when Jonah left the fish and he's lying there washed up on the shore, if you know, the realization just came to him as he's lying there, I didn't die after all. I have this second chance. And if perhaps he didn't jump up and run back to Gath Hefer, which is where he's from in the Galilee, running home to tell everyone about what happened to him and what it meant. You know, if he had done that though, and I'm not saying he did, I don't know that he would have been as received as well as he anticipated when he got home. Because remember, he just spent 72 hours in the stomach of a fish. And although we understand Jonah was protected supernaturally in that circumstance from death, certainly, that doesn't mean that was a consequence-free experience. That doesn't su suggest, for example, that he had absolutely no ill effects. To the contrary, I would assume that a person who was subjected to that kind of environment for that length of time certainly had some things happen to him. For example, his body was exposed to the acids of that fish's stomach for an extended period of time, to chemicals whose purpose it is to dissolve organic material like that man's body. And like any acid, it would have started working on some things first, like hair, and the color of the skin would have been bleached, more than likely white. And add to that the fact that he had been in a violent storm wearing the kind of clothing in his day which was not very tight-fitting, not very secure, it's likely he may have lost most or all of his clothing in the water. And what was left probably didn't hold up very well in the stomach of the fish. So I want you to imagine, if you can, a hairless, bleached, white, stark, naked man walking up from the beach. <laughs> Except this isn't California. This is Israel. All right? this, isn't, this isn't normal. 
I don't think he would have been well received under those circumstances, not in his hometown certainly, and he would have presented a very striking image when he arrived in the city of Nineveh. Now I'm reading quite a bit into the text. Who knows what he really looked like, of course. And in fact, speaking of Nineveh, God hasn't forgotten that that's why he's gone to so much trouble in Jonah's case. Because as we start tonight in chapter 3, verse 1, look what comes next. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I'm going to tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. We'll pause there just for a moment. Very pointedly, the author of this book, who we would believe to be Jonah, says, the word of the Lord came a second time. This is the second time God has given Jonah instructions. And you can't help but get the point as is presented here in chapter 3, because in light of what just transpired in the first two chapters of this book, and reminding ourselves that what had begun at the very start of chapter 1 was the same proclamation that you see received now here at the beginning of chapter 3. The symmetry is obvious. The first time the word of the Lord came to Jonah, he flees, and then all the miseries of chapter 1 and 2 come next. Now, he gets exactly the same proclamation at the beginning of chapter 3. It's not substantially different. In fact, it's substantially the same as what he received the first time. And now he's going to take a different path. You know, he says, Arise, go to Nineveh, and proclaim what I tell you. And specifically, proclaim that judgment would come upon the city. The beginning here of chapter 3 reminds me of a very practical, biblical principle that I think many people have never considered when it comes to the issue of godly obedience. And, And it goes something like this. If you want to be obedient to God's will in your own decision making, but you don't know what God's will is, regarding some particular situation, then do the last thing God told you until you hear from Him again. People, I think, make too much at times about the fact that I'm not hearing from God. I don't know what He wants me to do. Well, that's all right. He won't necessarily speak to you 24 hours a day, one way or the other. But He's probably told you something in the past. Do the last thing you heard Him tell you until you hear something new. Often, God will not give you new instruction of any significance until you're in compliance with his last instruction. You know what to do. I've already told you what to do. If you keep coming back to the well, I'm not going to give you a different answer. Do the last thing you've been asked until you hear something new. Jonah, in this case, had been told to go to Nineveh. And now, after traveling a long distance by foot, over land, then uh, spending days tossed at sea, and then three days in the, body, in the belly of a fish, now he's back on land, And Jonah might have asked the question, if he had thought to in the moment, something like, God, what do you want me to do now? After all that's happened, what's the new plan? And the answer would have come back, the plan is to do the last thing I told you. There's no new plan, it's the same plan. In our own experience, we may not be in a fish, we may not have such dramatic revelation, but I do think in some cases, we find ourselves experiencing life's travails, maybe as a function of our own disobedience, seeing our world turned upside down, and then at the end of that, crying out to God, what is it, God, I'm supposed to do? When in many cases we know exactly what we're to do, we just didn't do it the first time. I don't think that Jonah's experience is all that unique, at least not in that respect. And I wouldn't call that a a law or a biblical certainty, because clearly there are times when God's instructions may change for one reason or another, even if we haven't obeyed. But I do think it is the case that he seeks obedience more than anything else. If you may remember the verses out of 1 Samuel 15, when Samuel says, Has the Lord so much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. You know, what he's saying there effectively is this. You sacrifice when you've sinned. I would prefer you obey than to need the sacrifice required for sin. uh, Jonah's sacrifice in this came... Uh, in this case, came in the form of a fish. Our sacrifice, if you will, sacrifice of praise would come in many cases in the midst of despair brought about by our own sinful consequences. God will accept that praise, yes, but then he'll say, here you are, back on your feet, now go do what I asked you to do the last time we talked. I believe that is often God's plan, plan and often his pattern. With the experience of this fish fresh on his mind, that was a pun, It doesn't get any better than this, folks. If you can't laugh at that, I mean, there's nothing else. Sorry. You want me to go back to the puns at the end of chapter one? All right, then. 
All right, so he obeys this time he leaves for Nineveh. End of verse 3, as I read it there, raises a very puzzling question. It's one that you'll see debated quite often in commentaries if you take time to read them. At the first reading, you might conclude that what, Jonah had, or what uh, the author has said in chapter 3, verse 3, is that Nineveh was three days' walk away from where Jonah was at this point. That might be one way to read the text. That, that may have come to you as the natural reading. But that interpretation doesn't fit the text for at least two reasons. First, Nineveh was much farther than three days' walk from anywhere in Israel. You go look at a map, it's, it's clear across most of Arabia on the other side toward modern-day Iraq. So no man could walk there in three days. I don't care how fast you walk. Secondly, the description of this distance was used to amplify or explain the earlier statement in that verse that Nineveh was a great city. In other words, it's to be read this way. Nineveh is a great city. How great? It's a three days walk. Well, you don't describe a city as great because of how far away it is. No, not, not in this context. It's a description of how big it is about how big it is. The answer is found in Genesis chapter 10 when you first hear of Nineveh being established by Nimrod in the days and the years after the flood. Genesis 10 verse 11, describing where Nineveh set up the city, or I'm sorry, where uh, Nimrod set up the city of uh, Nineveh, here's how it's described. From that land he, meaning Nimrod, went forth into Assyria and built Nineveh and Rehobothir and Kalah and Rezin, between Nineveh and Kalah. That is the great city. So all those names you just heard me mention are all names of towns which together form the great city. And it, it is a large city comprised principally of Nineveh itself, but it also includes three smaller surrounding towns which we could call suburbs, for the lack of a better term. Taken together, they are the great city. And that metropolis of people is so large that a man would have to walk three days to cross the city. And an average man walked about 20 miles, and therefore you're talking about a very large city. In fact, this conglomeration of cities, if you will, would fit in the space, would, would, would cover the space between here and Austin. In ancient times, huge city. This is a very great city. The term is not an under, uh, overstatement. If anything, it's an understatement, as it's presented in Scripture. Now, I want you to think about your challenge if you're Jonah. Your challenge is this. You're to convert that city. And in typical biblical style, we're not talking about a partial conversion. It's an all or none. So the whole city is to be converted. Now, if you were Jonah, you have no radio, you have no phone, you have no cars, you have no bullhorns. It's you and a, and a tunic and some sandals. And you've got this job ahead of you. How much could you hope to accomplish for what God has demanded of you? Now, if you thought about that and said, well, there's practically speaking no way I could accomplish this mission, then you're already on the wrong track. In other words, if you were Jonah and you would allow that thought to come to mind, you're already off the page of God's plan. You're on the wrong track. Because you're already thinking that your success or failure is dependent on your human physical abilities. You've made that assumption if you've looked at the task and looked at yourself and said, that city and me, and this is what God has called me to do? Well, it's clearly an impossible task. Because declaring God's truth to men is not a function of man's ability. It happens by God's power, whether on foot, by car, with a satellite, or with just one man's voice. It is not by human ability that God's word is spread. Jonah, chapter 3, verse 4, continues. Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk. And now look what happened. He cried out and said... Yet forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God. They called a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. So Jonah sets out in this city. He makes one day's walk. Now you realize why this description given in chapter 3, verse 3 is so significant because it puts in contrast starkly what the task was and how little, really, Jonah achieved in that task. He walks one day into a city that takes three days to cross. And he says, in 40 days, the city would be overthrown. There's more going on here than meets the eye or ear. The Hebrew word for overthrown here is hafak, H-A-P-H-A-K. In the days since Moses wrote the Torah, clearly these events came many centuries after that. 
So Jonah had the Torah, the nation of Israel had the Torah, it had been long established and read and, not, and known. In the days since Moses wrote the Torah, the word hafak in the Hebrew had gained a unique meaning. Yes, it means to overthrow, that's its literal meaning, but I want you to think of it like the phrase 9-11. Before September 11, 2001, the phrase 9-11 probably had very little, if any, special meaning to you or anyone else. You could have used that term, 9-11, 9-11, and they would have said, don't you mean 7-11? You know, or you could have said 9-11, and you say, dummy, it's 9-1-1. Right? But in the days since that date, the phrase 9-11 is loaded with meaning. If you were a person to walk into an airport today, for example, and announce to the guards at your security checkpoint that before this day was over, there would be another 9-11, what do you think would happen? Right? You wouldn't get on the airplane, I'll tell you that much. Well, the word hafak, H-A-P-H-K, was a word that God used repeatedly in his conversation with Abraham in chapter 19 of Genesis when he disclosed his plans to Abraham for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And as a result, ever since Moses recorded those words in Genesis, they had become synonymous in the minds of those in the nation of Israel and even those outside the city or outside the nation of Israel, that word had become synonymous with the destruction of those two cities. You could think of it like the word Kleenex or like the word Jello. Jello is a brand name for a gelatin dessert, but now we just call everything that wiggles Jello, right? Kleenex is the brand name for facial tissue, but we call everything we see like that Kleenex. Similarly, Hafak had become a way of saying, your city is going to be laid waste like Sodom and Gomorrah. It communicated a ton. It was a loaded word. It didn't just mean overthrow in some generic sense. It meant specifically that the inhabitants of Nineveh were 40 days away from experiencing exactly the same thing that happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. And it was very clearly understood by them to mean that. If you don't know much about the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, you should know that that those two cities were utterly destroyed by God in a moment for their wickedness. Not, not nothing was left. Not the people, not the buildings, not the animals. They were wiped off the face of the earth so thoroughly, in fact, that even today there's debate among archaeologists about where those cities were actually located in their day. And it was associated with cities that were so wicked that we still use those words today as euphemisms for extreme depravity. We've even taken the word Sodom and turned it into sodomy and made it a law. That's how... That's how much those cities still resonate in man's thought processes today. Whether you believe in the Bible or not, you just say Sodom and Gomorrah and everybody knows what you're talking about. Or at least they know what you're, you know, what you're referencing generally, even if they don't know the story. So just like today, Gentiles in the ancient world were just as familiar with the story of Sodom and Gomorrah as we are today. It was not limited to the Jewish mindset. It certainly wasn't limited to those who had read their Bibles or scrolls in that day. So with all of that background, he walks in and he basically declares to these people that they're going to see a similar outcome. They're the next Sodom and Gomorrah. And they've got 40 days to prepare for it. And as I said a moment ago, he gets that message out with really a marginal effort. You know, he walks one-third of the way through a, a city that could have kept him walking another two days if he had been interested. Now, it's not clear if he stops because he finds so much success after only one day. In other words, maybe he didn't need to go any further. Or is it simply an indication of how little effort he was willing to put into the whole thing? It's not really clear to me which one is true, although I tend to see him from the perspective of somebody who really didn't want to see the city repent, who understood the history of the Ninevites and of the the Assyrians and their long-standing war with the nation of Israel. And, And as enemies, he wasn't particularly motivated to get this message out. And as I alluded to on the very first night we taught, there's actually a little more here to Jonah's opposition than meets the eye. It's not strictly for the reasons I just mentioned. There's another important reason why Jonah did not want to preach to the Ninevites, and tonight's the night I get to tell you that. Jonah's ministry took place, as you remember, I think I told you the first night, during the reign of a king, Jeroboam II, for the northern kingdom of Israel. And it was during the years of about 780 B.C. to about 770 B.C. that the events of Jonah probably took place. In that same period of time, there was another man in the nation of Israel, a prophet, a contemporary prophet of Jonah, a man named Amos. Now, Amos was a farmer, not a professional, uh, a religious man. 
Most prophets were professional religious men, men who had gone to literally prophet schools. Tr- professional, you know, what you might think of a seminary in some sense, but that was traditionally where prophets went. He didn't have that background. He was a farmer. He was a layman, if you will. But yet God called on him to pronounce God's word to a wicked nation and included, in fact, pronouncements against many of the Canaanite nations that surrounded the nation of Israel in that day. It was a broad pronouncement against that region of the world for its wickedness. That's what Amos is doing contemporaneously with what Jonah is being called to do now in Nineveh. And here's what Amos proclaimed to the nation of Israel. He said, The nation of Israel had sinned so greatly against God that God had lost patience with that nation and that that nation was now lost, that there would be no reprieve, that God had once and for all decided that that nation was going to be removed from his presence, the northern kingdom now, the the ten tribes that made up the northern, northern kingdom. They were going to be judged harshly and there was no way to stop it. That was what Amos' message was. In fact, let me just read you a small section of it. Amos chapter 4, verse 11. God's speaking through Amos. God says, I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were like a firebrand snatched from a blaze. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. You know the phrase, prepare to meet your maker? That's where it comes from. Prepare to meet your maker. You know, if God ever says that to you... (laughs) At one point in that book, Amos tells the nation that they're going to be taken captive and they're going to be taken to a place called Kir, K-I-R. That's how it's written in in Amos. Kir is the ancient name for the region of Mesopotamia. The land that in Amos' day was controlled by Assyria, whose capital was Nineveh. So here's Jonah walking through the capital city of this very same nation that he knows from what has been spoken through his contemporaries in his own day, he knows this is the nation God has appointed to bring a destruction upon his very own countrymen for their sin. In fact, Amos' prophecy included, as I mentioned in the verses I read, references to Sodom and Gomorrah as examples of what God was prepared to do to his very own people as a result of their wickedness. Now, here's Jonah given word to proclaim the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah upon Nineveh, even as Amos behind him is doing the very same thing to his own countrymen, only now here's the paradoxical twist for Jonah. On the one hand, his own beloved people, the nation of Israel, stand in jeopardy to God's wrath with no hope of reprieve, while on the other hand, God brings a similar message of judgment upon a nation that has been designated as Israel's destroyer, but this time it includes an opportunity for reprieve. And to add insult to injury, the man that God uses to bring that message to to the nation of Israel's enemy is the prophet given to the nation of Israel. So it's this tremendous burden on Jonah that he has to consider going to Nineveh, preaching a message of judgment that ultimately, if it works will result in the city being spared only so that it could exist now to come and destroy Israel. But if he were to not send the message and the city were not to repent and and therefore it was to be destroyed, it wouldn't exist. And if it wouldn't exist, then it couldn't come and destroy his own nation. That's what's burdening this man in addition to his general predisposition against Gentiles, certainly against this nation of enemies. It puts him again in a different light, perhaps. And now we perhaps have a better understanding of why God's call was so difficult and why he worked so hard not to obey it, at least at first. But with all of that having been said, how motivated do you think he's going to be as he walks into that city? It seems to me there's also a clear message here, even as we come back to Jonah in a moment, about the nature of our ministries in service to God based on this difference between how God used Jonah and how he used Amos. You know, the word ministry simply means service at its root. We all are ministers by virtue of our service to the body of Christ, and we are all called to ministry. I don't care if you're on staff and paid for it. I don't care if you volunteer. I don't care if you just do it in your home, by your bedside, praying in your gift of prayer. It's ministry. It's all ministry, and none of us have a get-out-of-ministry-free card. Not as we've been saved and, and brought into faith through the body of Christ, into the body of Christ. We are all ministers of Christ at some level. God calls men to serve Him, and His call, we've already studied this, is unqualified. 
And it is unqualified in that he may call a trained religious servant like Jonah, or he may call an everyday common man farmer like Amos. And he may call us on a ministry to our own people in the church or in our neighborhood or in our home, or he may call us to minister to a foreign people a thousand miles away. And he may call us to deliver a message that people want to hear or a message they refuse to hear. And he may call us to a ministry <clears throat> that agrees with our own personal desires or to a ministry that offends our pride and frustrates our plans. He may call us to witness to a people or he may call us to witness against a people. But the bottom line is, God can call and use as he determines for any purpose he decides. And obedience is not measured by our desires but by his. He called Amos and to Jonah to different outcomes to different people in the same day for a purpose that ultimately worked together for good. But in their own moments and in their own perspectives, they may have had time, uh, certainly Jonah had times of struggle, understanding how fulfilling God's call could lead to good. What that teaches you in a moment is your perspective is not adequate to judge God's purpose. Neither is mine, of course. And above all, and regardless of which place we find ourselves serving or where God calls us, God's call to us is first and foremost to obey Him and trust Him for whatever purposes He has in mind. Just trust is fundamentally about not evaluating, but rather believing. You know, there'll be times when we will serve God through uh, in ways that align or intersect with contemporaries. You know, it's going to be the case that we'll have an opportunity to serve with another person in the same church or in the same ministry or in the same neighborhood. And for a time, our work may align. But ultimately, you have to be true to your own calling. And I find it interesting how often people's calling to a ministry will take second seat, back seat, to their alignment with some other individual in ministry. And that we never want to let ourselves stray into that mindset where we are serving because of somebody or with somebody rather than serving the Lord wherever that may be, and understanding that for times and in places we'll have chance to align and then there may be a time in the future where we separate, just as Paul and Barnabas did, of course. Finally, the people of Nineveh were told they respond in verse 5. Look what Jonah said to the people. He didn't say, repent. There's no record that he used that word. He didn't say, you have an escape clause. He never suggested there's a way out of this judgment. He said, in 40 days you will be judged. And when the people heard that, this is what they did. First, they believed God. They believed the Word of God. You and I would say, when we say we believe the Word of God, we're speaking principally about this book. But for what they had been given, for what constituted revelation to these people, that was exclusively nothing more than what Jonah had given them in the statement he made. They believed that statement and attributed it to God. And in that sense, they believed God. I mean, think about it. He wouldn't have exactly been the most motivated guy when it came to giving this message, as we've said already. And yet his proclamation was a big hit. It had a huge impact. The people here are professing belief. They're showing signs of repentance. The signs would include, obviously, the sackcloth, the, the, which, by the way, is a very rough kind of burlap type of material that was commonly worn by the poor or when you're in mourning, like over a death. So they're mourning their own deaths in advance, basically, by putting on the sackcloth. And they show this repentance. Why did they do that? They've shown faith in his word. They've responded with repentance, though the message came from an unmotivated speaker without hardly any real direction on how to respond. Why did they think repentance would have any effect? Why were they willing to repent? What did they think they would gain? One of the notable aspects, as I said, of Sodom and Gomorrah was that that city, those cities were destroyed suddenly without warning. There was no warning. There was no prophet sent to spare the city. Only the righteous, of Lot, righteous family of Lot and his immediate family received any mercy. And they did so on the basis of the two angels that came in very, very quietly and took them out. There was no general warning to the city. No one knew it was coming. Uh, Jesus describes it this way in, in Luke chapter 17, verse 28. He said, It was the same as happened in the days of Lot, speaking about how his days of his return will be. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. Jesus uses Sodom and Gomorrah as an example of just how sudden and unexpected his return will be. 
which just amplifies the fact that in their day, they were destroyed under very sudden circumstances. No warning at all. God never had the intention of bringing repentance to those cities, and therefore there was no point in bringing a warning. In the case of this city, he brings a warning, which the people correctly interpreted to mean, we still have a chance. Why warn me 40 days before the event, except that you're hoping I might respond appropriately and gain your favor and stop the destruction? That's my understanding for why they would even respond to Jonah's statement in the first place. Ultimately, the real answer, though, for why the people do what they do is that God purposed to save the city and therefore His Spirit brought this response to God's Word. And if there were any doubt that that were true, we know it from two details in the description we've read already. First, we're told all the people in the city, not just some, and not just those who happened to hear Jonah, but all the people in the city had this reaction. Now, we already know from the description he's only walked a certain distance into the city. There's no telegraph. There's no way that he gets up on the satellite television and projects his image to the whole city. And yet, somehow, for just a portion of the city hearing the message, nevertheless, the whole city responded to the message. Friends, that's a supernatural response. You cannot explain that in human terms. You cannot say, oh, well, Steve, one person told one person and one person told one That kind of response, that kind of, of, of clarity to the message and unanimity to the response is a clear sign of God's work in the heart and a purpose to save the city. Secondly, we're told it was from the least to the greatest. It wasn't limited to a certain group or a certain age or a certain stat, strata within the uh, culture. It was a universal acceptance. And to give you an example of what I mean by that, why that's so significant, let me, let me try to draw a comparison in your own life and our lives here today. If we were to look at a moment where Billy Graham is ready to step into Yankee Stadium, as he has done in, in the past, and conduct one of his crusades, and I want you to imagine Yankee Stadium filled to the brim with people waiting to hear what he has to say. And before he walked into that room, into that building, into that stadium, I want you to predict for me how many people are likely to get up out of their seats and come down to the stage at the invitation and profess Christ. Out of 60,000 people, let's say, how many do you predict will actually respond to what he is going to say? Now, I doubt any of you would have predicted the entire stadium. But I want you to imagine that when he walks in and he gives his message, he doesn't stand up and preach eloquently for 20 minutes. He says only what Jonah says. And then he sits down. Doesn't make an invitation. Doesn't ask anyone to do anything. And not only does the entire stadium repent, but the entire city of New York does. Someone out in Queens stands up in his home in the middle of the night and repents, and he never heard, much less set foot in, Yankee Stadium. That's what just happened. How do you explain that? Well, um, clearly, you cannot explain that in human terms. This was a supernatural act of God to bring repentance to this nation. I, I think it's high time that as a generation, we lived what we say we believe in this area. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of Christ. Faith does not come by methodology. Faith does not come by marketing. Faith does not come by any man-made, contrived way of gaining acceptance verbally from somebody you can influence in those ways. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of Christ. If the Word of Christ is not central to the ministry, you are not working the right way. If it is not by a conviction of the Spirit through the Word, it is not genuine repentance, it is not true faith. That is how God does it, because He's the only one who can do it. But it is also to say that we think too small when we think we cannot save unless we can get people to sit down and listen to us in a certain way on a certain level. Jonah was about as unlikely an evangelist as you can imagine, and not even Pentecost can compare with the response that he received to God's Word. If Jonah can do this, and God can use it for the purpose he set forth, then what limits are we prepared to put on God for what he can accomplish with a little bit of obedience on our part? Again, we don't presume the outcome, we just don't limit it nor do we manipulate it. And the church today is, I think, in general, not necessarily everywhere, but in general it has reduced itself down to accepting that basic business and marketing practices are the hope for how the church is to convert. God forbid we ever rest on that rather than on God himself. Jonah 3, verse 6. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robes from him, 
covered himself with sackcloth and sat on the ashes. He issued a proclamation, and it said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. Both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth, and let men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger anger, so that we will not perish. So having reached everywhere else in the kingdom, naturally the same message reaches the king. Now, some have looked at this text and said, really what we just read from verses 6 through 9 is an amplification of verse 5. That effectively, everyone repented simultaneously to include the king, but in the way the king did it, we see a description of his specific response. Either that or if he just came last, it doesn't matter. The king repented in this way. He displays it in traditional ways. This man, by the way, based on the timing of Jonah's book, and Jonah's one of the few prophets who we can date so precisely based on the clues within the book, this is probably King Adad Narari III, who was a king in the time of, of Jonah in uh, Assyria. Interesting, if you go to Assyrian records, historical records, and the Assyrians were very good at record keeping, they were very precise. In their records, they tell us that this particular king was unique because he was monotheistic. Unlike kings of his day, before and after, he worshipped one God only. Now, the records are not clear enough for us to know which God is intended. It's just fascinating that he did not worship a pluralistic God, a number of gods. He was unique in that he worshipped only one. It stands to reason, therefore, that that history is known because of this moment, how this influenced the man's heart, and he was forevermore now a worshipper of the true living God. It's also clear that it didn't last that the nation of Assyria didn't become forever a kingdom of the, na- of the one living God. But for this generation, it had that effect. Just briefly, you notice the three things he did to demonstrate humility and repentance yet again. He left his throne. That doesn't just mean he kind of got up so he could speak. It means, more significantly, he refused to take his seat on the throne. For a time, during this period of mourning, he was signifying that God was the authority in this matter. He was not going to uh, take that seat. Secondly, he took off his robe, which was another public sign here of his authority. And in place of it, he put a sackcloth on, just like the people. Again, that sign of mourning. Finally, he sits in ashes. That's exactly what he did. If you're wondering what that means, it means he sat in ashes. Why? It's just a display of mourning. It, it, it's, it's significant, or it's a symbolic, rather. It, it, had, you know, it was just a tradition. But it was a very important one because it made a very clear statement. So he's mourning... He's repenting, and he tells you exactly why, in the hope that God would relent. By the way, what do you make of the fact that he's having all the animals sort of do this with him? You know, does this mean that he thought the livestock needed to repent as well? No, uh, you would have hopefully not come to that conclusion. It was rather an expression of what the owner felt. How many of you have seen people who dress up their dogs at Christmas with, like, Christmas sweaters? Is it because the dog is celebrating Christmas? How much do you think he gets out of it, right? No, it's a sign of what the adult is going through. They just use the dog like a billboard. It's the same thing here. The, the cattle are just another way of expressing their own feelings of repentance. The king says, no one would eat or drink. Now, in the text, it says, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. How long can you go without water? Seven days, maybe a little longer if you really stretch it. This is a very limiting kind of d- demand, isn't it? It's putting a time limit, if you will, to their circumstances, an even greater one than the one God has placed on them. It's probably the surest sign yet of the strength and commitment of his belief in what God had said. He's effectively condemned the city to death within about seven to ten days unless God relents. Which is to say, he was so certain that the city would in fact be destroyed in 40 days that from his perspective, I'm dead either way, I might have a hope, though, if I demonstrate repentance, that I'll at least call off the dogs, if you will, that God won't come through with what He's promised. You don't take that kind of a step, that kind of an extreme uh, step, unless you are convinced that death is coming through that proclamation. It's the surest sign that he believed in what Jonah had said. It was an all-or-nothing strategy designed to win God over. Finally, and not, not insignificantly, he says everyone was to turn from their evil deeds. And it's important to note here, repentance isn't true repentance if it isn't accompanied by a turning away from the sin that prompted the repentance in the first place. 
It's real, you know, words are cheap. It's real easy to say you repent and then go right back to doing what you did the moment before you said those words. You know, that only fools somebody for a little while and probably no one but yourself. Repentance must be accompanied by a turning away so that it can demonstrate the truth of the statement, so that it backs up the words. And I would argue that if you're not prepared to turn, don't use the words. Wait until you feel like doing what you say you want to do. Jonah then in verse 10 says this, When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. God relented. The word there in Hebrew literally means changed his mind. It's an interesting word. It can also be translated repented. Or it appears changed his plans. That kind of summary statement, that kind of language always carries with it, I think, some confusion for how is it that God could change his mind, especially when we know there is Scripture to the extent to tell us clearly God is not a man that he should repent or change his mind. And we know just by the nature of who God is and by his omniscience and his omnipotence that he has no need to ever change his mind. You know, one of the reasons you, you and I change our minds is because we, we have an opinion today based on the facts of today, and then time intervenes. And what time has a tendency to do is it, it changes facts. We learn something new we didn't know then. Or just circumstances change so that what was true then is no longer true now. And all of those factors mean that it's possible for us to think something this way today and then in a little bit of time think something differently tomorrow. We change our mind because of one thing and one thing only. Time. Time is the element that makes it necessary for us to change our mind. Now, if it were possible for us to remove the element of time so that we knew everything all at once, so that there was no new information possible, there was no chance something else could be known. We already know it all. Well, some of us do know it all, but that's a different story. Then it would be, it'd be impossible to change your mind because you would have looked at all the data, assessed it all at once, and come to the understanding you need in that moment, and now there's nothing new available to change your mind with. That's God, if you can imagine that. He knew exactly what was going to happen before it happened. He already had taken that into account. His mind already knew of that event. This is not a surprise, in other words. So it is not as though they had to convince him to do something he wasn't planning to do. It's not as though he suddenly discovered, oh, look at that, they did it after all, imagine that. I guess I won't have to destroy them. No, that's not how God thinks. But how do you, as the writer, as the human observer of what God's doing, how do you express that? What's the way you come to say, God said this, they did that, and so God did this? You use language like he didn't do what he said he was going to do. He changed his mind. He, he refrained from doing what he said he was going to do. You use language that explains it from human perspective because that's who you are and that's who you're writing to. We call that an anthropomorphism. It's like when God walked through the garden. garden. He doesn't have feet. He can't walk, but yet we say he walked. It's like when we say that our prayers rise up to him like a sweet-smelling incense. He doesn't have a nose. He can't smell in the sense you and I do, but we use those terms. In the same way, we say he changed his mind because in human ways of thinking, that's the easiest way we know to express it. But don't turn that into theology. Don't turn that into some kind of rule about the nature and character of God because now you've walked off the plank and you've forgotten another scripture that makes very clear that that is not the way God works. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't need to. He's not a man that he should change his mind, as scripture puts it. That tonight is where we're going to end. We'll come back in next week at chapter 3, verse 11. And, or, yeah, if there was a chapter 3, verse 11, that's where we would be, I guarantee you. But since there isn't, we'll come into chapter 4, I should have said. And we'll, we'll probably not finish the chapter next time we meet. That's in two weeks. But I hope you have some things to think about that will carry you through Thanksgiving. Not what I've given you, perhaps. What God has given you, I hope. But I hope it's enough to carry you for two weeks. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we know, Father, in Your Word that You seek obedience from those You've called to faith. That obedience, Father, is the measure by which You will bless those, Father, who please You. Blessings, Father, come in many ways, and we presume nothing except, Father, Your pleasure in us. But we know certainly, as Your Word tells us, Father, that You would much rather us obey in the first place than to seek forgiveness, to make sacrifice after the fact. 
Father, I pray that from what we've studied tonight in Jonah, we would have a heart to obey. We We would have a heart to hear your word, to answer your call, to not test you as Jonah did, but to uh, obediently, Father, walk as you command us, knowing that you work all things to good for those who you love, who are called according to your purpose. I pray, Father, that uh, we would never uh, forget that. We would never consider, Father, that we can know better than you what our calling should be or where we should go. And as we obey, Father, I pray you would continue to encourage us along that path, letting us see, Father, that we are moving as you direct so that we can stay by your side and all that you intend to do. Thank you, Father, for the obedience and patience of those who have come tonight to hear your word. I pray that the work done in their heart is by your power and through the Holy Spirit and that they would give you glory for all that you do. And in the weeks to come, Father, guard them, protect them, and bring them back according to your will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.